Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2024. Yes, and welcome to the reading of the lesson for November 9. It's from the series on the Gospel of John, written by Edward Zinke and Thomas R. Shepherd, and it's titled More Testimonies About Jesus, and your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 2. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Once again, as we open your word, we pray for the Holy Spirit to guide our minds. As we learn more about Jesus this week, as we listen to some of the stories of his life and the people he interacted with, as we listen to how John couches this in language that brings us to understand who Jesus is, but also how to love him more, we pray that we will walk forward in our lives in such a way that we will share this knowledge with others, but also so that we can help those in our own families and in our communities. Lord, today I'd particularly like to pray for Jennifer Robinson, who's been seeking a new place to live, and for the Killy family from Kenya, for Mrs Horton, uh, who has requested prayer for someone else, for Malcolm and for Stuart, both of whom have medical issues and particularly for Dr. Kevin Mace, uh, who's from the Turks and Caicos Islands, who's had um, major surgery, Lord. We pray that you'll be with him, be with his family, as they support those around them. And now, as we open your word, we pray that every person who is listening to this reading of the Sabbath School lesson this week will be blessed, not because I'm reading it, but because of your word. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 11 and verse 32. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Let's read that again, John 12 verse 32. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Jesus doesn't merely say astonishing things about himself or about who he is or about who sent him or about where he came from. He also showed who he is by the miracles and signs that he performed. As some openly testify of Jesus, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which man has done? John 7 verse 31. He backed up his words with actions that proved the truth of his words. But, as the drama continues, a division begins among the people. The healing of the man by the pool of Bethesda attracts the ire of some leaders. The discussion in Capernaum following the feeding of the 5,000 results in the rejection of Jesus by the multitudes. The resurrection of Lazarus creates faith in some but triggers in others a hostility that will lead to the trial and execution of Jesus. This week's lesson looks at some of those who witnessed and testified about Jesus. In each of these incidents, some aspects of who Jesus really is are revealed, and together they create a deeper vision of Jesus, the Messiah. Sunday, November 3, Humility of Soul, John the Baptist Testifies Again. Lesson 2 described how the witness of John the Baptist brought the first disciples, Andrew and John, Peter, Philip and Nathaniel, to Jesus. One would expect that the Baptist, having given his witness, would move off the scene, but he reappears several times in the Gospel of John. Read John chapter 3, verses 25 to 36. How does John the Baptist compare himself to Jesus? John 3, beginning at verse 25. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, He is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, 
I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him, and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. The one who comes after is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. A dispute arose between John the Baptist's disciples and an unnamed Jew about purification, likely a question over the efficacy of baptism. We'll compare this with Mark chapter 1 and verses 4 and 5. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Interestingly, when his disciples came to John, no doubt to resolve the question, they bring up Jesus, saying, He is baptizing, and all are going to him, in John 3, verse 26. It is not hard to read between the lines. They are jealous of Jesus, jealous for their master, and jealous for themselves as well. It would be all too easy for John to indulge in the jealousy, but he does not, because he knows what his mission is. Instead, he reminds his disciples that he never claimed to be the Christ. On the contrary, he came to point toward him, to prepare the way for him, to be a witness about him, as we read in John 1, verses 6 to 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Using the illustration of a wedding, he calls himself the friend of the bridegroom, with Jesus as the bridegroom. The bride would be the people of God, as we would compare with Hosea chapter 2, verses 16 to 23. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the names of the Baals from your lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds in the sky, and the creatures that move along the ground. Bow and sword and battle I will abolish from the land, so that all may lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me for ever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth, and the earth will respond to the grain, the new wine and the olive oil, and they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people, and they will say, you are my God. And we also compare it to Isaiah 62 verses 1 to 5. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, for Jerusalem's sake I will not remain quiet, till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication, and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. 
No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hepzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Then, in words that show John's true greatness, he says, He must increase, but I must decrease, in John 3, verse 30. John 3, verses 31 to 36, continues the comparison between Jesus and John, showing the superiority of the Messiah over his forerunner. With John's testimony pointing toward Jesus, the idea of witness is again emphasised. Those who receive that testimony and believe in Jesus have eternal life. Those who do not receive him remain under the wrath of God. That's what the text says. God loves the world and sent his Son to redeem the world, as you read in John three sixteen and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. But those who refuse the gift offered them will have to pay the penalty for their own sins, eternal death. And so to finish the day, how can we learn the lesson of humility before both God and humanity? What can we learn from the example of John here about humility of the soul? Monday, November 4, A New Understanding of the Messiah Read John chapter 1, verses 32 to 36. What does John the Baptist say here about Jesus that the people were not expecting about the long-awaited Messiah? John 1, beginning at verse 32. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen, and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The Jews looked for a Messiah to come who would deliver them from the rule of Rome. Long under oppression, the Jews believed that the Messiah would not only overthrow Rome, but would establish them as a great and powerful nation. John's words, however, calling Jesus the Lamb of God, although directly pointing to his atoning sacrifice, were probably misunderstood by the majority of the people. They might have not known what he was talking about at all. Thus John, with his gospel, wanted to change their understanding of the Messiah so that they could recognise in Jesus the fulfilment of the prophecies regarding the coming King and what he would do. He was not coming as a political and military leader, but to offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. That was his purpose. Only after that, when all is finished, will the final kingdom come, as we read in Daniel 7.18. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it for ever, yes, for ever and ever. And in the Desire of Ages, page 136, we read, When at the baptism of Jesus John pointed to him as the Lamb of God, a new light was shed upon the Messiah's work. The prophet's mind was directed to the words of Isaiah in Isaiah 53, verse 7. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. End of quote. In John 1, 31, John says, I did not know him. The whole verse reads, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed 
to Israel. So, how then did John come to know Jesus as the Messiah? The answer is that the Lord who sent John had previously said to him in John one thirty three and 34, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. In other words, God revealed to John that Jesus was the Messiah. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, we read in 1 Corinthians one twenty four. Knowledge that Jesus is the Christ comes from God himself through the convicting power of his Spirit. This theme appears frequently in John. Salvation does not come from worldly philosophy, science or higher learning. It comes only from God to a heart surrendered in faith and obedience to Jesus. And so to finish today, how would we know the truth about Jesus as our atoning sacrifice unless it were revealed to us? Why then is knowing the Bible and what it teaches about Jesus so crucial? Tuesday, November 5. Acceptance and Rejection Lesson 2 described the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6, but did not cover the final section of that story, which is studied here. Read John chapter 6, verses 51 to 71. What did Jesus say that people had trouble accepting? John chapter 6, beginning at verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever." He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing, the words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life, yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Having just been fed miraculously by Jesus, the people were ready to crown him king. And we read that in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 15. Some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him, because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. 
Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About five thousand men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. But in talking with them later at the Capernaum synagogue, he explained the spiritual meaning of the miracle, saying, I am the bread of life. In verse 35, he expounds in more detail that this bread is his flesh, which he gives for the life of the world. In verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. This saying opened the eyes of the multitude to the fact that Jesus would not be their earthly king. He did not fit the mould produced by earthly thinking. They refused conversion, which would transform the way they thought so that they could recognise and accept Jesus as the Messiah. Many of his disciples left him at this point, as we read in verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. From a human sense, this must have been hard for Jesus. The approbation of the crowd is pleasing. Who doesn't want to be liked? But seeing many people draw back and question one's principles is naturally discouraging as well. Seeing the multitude depart, Jesus asked his inner circle, the twelve, if they want to leave too. This is when Peter makes his amazing confession, another witness as to both what Jesus has and who he is. In verses 68 and 69 we read, You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. The disciples had been with Jesus for a couple of years, travelling with him, seeing his miracles, hearing his sermons. They knew from experience that there was no one comparable to him. The conviction settled upon them that, however unusual some situations might be, this man was the Messiah. Regardless of how much they still didn't understand about his purpose for coming, only after his death and resurrection did they start to understand why Jesus came. And so to finish the day, what can we learn from this story about the fact that the majority is usually wrong? Why must we remember this, especially with the aspects of our faith that are unpopular with the majority, even the majority of Christians? Wednesday, November 6, The Witness of the Father The Gospel of John begins by talking about the word, Logos, as being with God. That is, being with God the Father, as we read in John verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
When the Word became flesh, the Spirit testified about Jesus by resting on him at his baptism, as you read in the same chapter, verses 32 and 33. Then John gave this testimony, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen, and I testify, that this is God's chosen one. But the Father also testifies about Jesus during his earthly ministry. Read John chapter 5, verses 36 to 38. What does Jesus say here about the Father? John chapter 5, beginning at verse 36. I have testimony weightier than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. Jesus links the Father to the works and miracles that he had performed. He is very clear that the Father had sent him and also had testified about him. Read Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, Matthew 17, verse 5, Mark 1, verse 11, and Luke 3, verse 22. Also have a look at 2 Peter 1, 17 and 18. What does the Father say about Jesus? First of all, Matthew 3, verse 17, And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And Matthew 17, verse 5, While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And Mark chapter 1, verse 11, And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And Luke 3.22 and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And then we look at Second Peter chapter 1, verses 17 to 18. He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. At the baptism of Jesus, the Father and the Spirit joined the Son in marking this important occasion, the commencement of Jesus' ministry. The Father states that Jesus is his beloved Son, in whom he is well pleased. But at a crucial time in Christ's ministry, the Father speaks yet again this time as recorded in the Gospel of John. Things were reaching a climax in the final days of that ministry. The religious leaders, unable to stop him, wanted him dead. We read in John twelve nineteen. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now they wanted him dead more than ever. The crowds were exuberant over him, especially as more and more people, hearing the testimony of those who saw him raise Lazarus from the dead, as we read in John chapter 12, verses 17 and 18. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. And they were starting to follow Jesus. Even Greeks, there for the festival, wanted to see Jesus. At this point, in response to Jesus' words in John twelve twenty eight, Father, glorify your name, the Father again speaks from heaven in John twelve twenty eight, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it 
again. As we have already seen, Jesus' hour of glory is the cross. Thus, the Father's testimony about Jesus points to the great sacrifice of the Lamb of God for the sins of the world. It is the culmination of his earthly ministry. His death, in our behalf, paid the full penalty for our sins, and in him, by faith, we never have to face that penalty ourselves. Thursday, November 7. The Witness of the Crowd On the last day, we read in John 7, verses 37 to 38, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John recorded numerous times Jesus making bold statements about himself, about who he was, and what he came to do. The lines quoted above from John 7 verses 37 and 38 are another example of what Jesus claimed about himself and about what he would do to all who come to him. These were astonishing claims as well. When Jesus spoke to the Jews attending the Feast of Tabernacles, what was the response of many in the crowd? We read this story in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 53. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not Scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look at it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Then they all went home. Some said he was the prophet like Moses predicted long ago, as in Deuteronomy eighteen fifteen to 19 Let's read those verses. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites, you must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb in the day of the assembly, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell you everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. Others thought Jesus was the Christ. But this brought the argument that the Messiah would not come from Galilee, that he had to be of the Davidic line, and that he had to be born in Bethlehem all of which were true about Jesus. And you'll remember in Matthew chapter 1 and 2, the Bible tells us about that. 
though many did not seem to know this. Even the arresting officers were stymied by him and the eloquence of his words. The Pharisees responded to the officers with another question. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him in John 7.48? This question from the Pharisees gave John the opportunity again to bring in Nicodemus, who, after having had his meeting with Jesus, was seeking to protect Jesus from their machinations. As we read in John 7.51, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? Did Nicodemus ever accept Jesus as the Messiah? Though this scene does not prove that he had, between this act and what he did after Jesus died, recorded in John 19 verses 39 and 40, the Bible gives us solid evidence that Nicodemus did in fact come to believe in Jesus. John 19 beginning at verse 39. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. And so the answer to that question was yes. In fact, one of the Pharisees did believe in him after all. And so to finish today, read John 7 verse 49. What were the leaders saying that showed their disdain for the masses who followed after Jesus? What lesson might be here for us? John 7 and verse 49. No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Friday, November 8. Further Thought From the book The Desire of Ages, page 393, we read, To whom shall we go? The teachers of Israel were slaves to formalism. The Pharisees and Sadducees were in constant contention. To leave Jesus was to fall among sticklers for rites and ceremonies and ambitious men who sought their own glory. The disciples had found more peace and joy since they had accepted Christ than in all their previous lives. How could they go back to those who had scorned and persecuted the friend of sinners? They had long been looking for the Messiah. Now he had come. And they could not turn from his presence to those who were hunting his life and had persecuted them for becoming his followers. To whom shall we go? not from the teaching of Christ, his lessons of love and mercy to the darkness of unbelief, the wickedness of the world. While the Saviour was forsaken by many who had witnessed his wonderful works, Peter expressed the faith of the disciples, Thou art that Christ. The very thought of losing this anchor of their souls filled them with fear and pain. To be destitute of a Saviour was to be adrift on a dark, and stormy sea. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, in class, talk about the difficult question of why some people, when given evidence for Jesus as the Messiah and for the truth of Christianity, gladly accept it, and why others, when given the same evidence, reject it. Two, what more important truth could there be than that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Yet, how did we ever come to know this crucial truth? By science, natural law, natural theology, logic and reason? While these things could, in fact, lead us to believe in a creator God, a first cause, an unmoved mover or something else, None of these disciplines, either alone or even together, could teach us the most important truth that we need to know. Christ died for our sins. What should this fact that all these disciplines, even in principle, could not lead us to the one thing that we really need to know, teach us about how crucial it is to make the Bible our final and ultimate authority on matters of faith. And question three. 
Why is it so important for someone's own faith to recount the things God has done in his or her life? And reading our inside story, our mission story for this week is Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. We Didn't Send Anyone by Andrew McChesney. For four years, Donaldo Velasquez visited a Colombian prison every Friday to preach about Jesus. But one Friday he couldn't go. He worked as a carpenter and a client urgently needed his help. Moreover, Donaldo needed the money. Only four Seventh-day Adventists, Donaldo, two other church members and their pastor, had permission to visit the prison in Acacias, and Donaldo called them for help. No, I'm too busy, Ramsey said. Pedro also said he couldn't go. The pastor apologised, saying he was out of town. Donaldo wept and prayed. When his wife, Jesuita, Asked what was wrong, he explained that he didn't want to skip the meeting with the inmates, but he needed to work. Go, do your job, Jesuita said. God will provide. The next time Donaldo visited the prison, 38 inmates came to hear him preach. He was accompanied by another church member, Pedro. Where is the man who came last time, an inmate asked. We didn't send anyone, Donaldo replied. Yes, you did, said another inmate. A man preached to us. No, we didn't send anyone, Donaldo said, and he suggested that perhaps the preacher had belonged to another denomination. No, no, the inmate said. We know everyone who has permission to visit. This man has never visited before, and he wasn't from another church. Donaldo asked about the man's sermon, hoping for a clue to his identity. The inmate said he had spoken about the seventh-day Sabbath. Amazed, Donaldo asked, what did he look like? The inmates described him as tall, well-dressed, wearing a white shirt. They said he knew the Bible so well that he probably was a teacher. Pedro touched Donaldo's arm. An angel must have come and preached to them, he said. That's the only explanation. Donaldo, however, wasn't convinced. He went to the prison guard who registered visitors. The guard, a friend of Donaldo's, looked through the computer log and shook his head. No one came that day, he said. Astonished, Donaldo explained, now I have no doubt that the angel of the Lord came to teach the Bible in my place. Returning to the inmates, he informed them and they must have se- that they must have seen an angel. Six years have passed and nearly all 38 inmates have given their hearts to Jesus in baptism. Donaldo said he won't ever forget that day. Even though it is an incredible story, I believe God sent his heavenly messenger, he said. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering that helped two mission projects in Colombia last quarter. (laughs) 